Our first session is entitled Climate Adaptation in Action, Lessons Learned from the State of California. Through the, though the politics surrounding climate change remain somewhat contentious in the United States, sadly, mostly to party politics, the state of California has reigned steadfast in its leadership role in combating climate change. In 2006, California passed into law the California Global Warming, Solu um, the California Global Warming Solutions Act, otherwise known as AB 32. This landmark legislation set an absolute limit on greenhouse gas emissions and confirmed the state's commitment to transition to a sustainable clean energy economy. Under Governor Newsom's leadership, the state is working hard to meet its own net zero commitments with a goal of putting the state on a path towards 100% renewable energy and zero carbon electricity by 2045. Governor Newsom is also working to promote the preservation of the state's biodiversity through its 30 by 30 initiative to promote, uh, to protect 30% of the state's biodiversity by 2030. Here to tell us more about California's leadership promoting Climate Adaptation and Action are two of the state's top leaders, uh, Natural Resource Secretary Wade Krauckhoft and Silva Gunna, Vice Chair of the California Energy Commission. Our first speaker is Silva Gutna. <clears throat> um, Vice Chair Gutna is serving his first term as the California Energy, uh, the California Energy Commission. He was appointed by Governor Newsom in February of 2001 uh, to serve as a public member of the commission. And later in September 21 was appointed as the vice chair. He currently leads the commission's energy assessments. In his current, um, prior to his current role, he served as manager for, demand analysis, um, for the demand analysis office and deputy director of the energy commission's energy assessment division. The division uh, forecasts and assess energy demand and supplies. Before joining the commission, he served in a variety of capacities at the, Energy, at the Energy Efficiency Institute at UC Davis, and also was the director of research where he directed the Institute's operations and research portfolio. Vice Chair Gutna holds a master's of science degree in mechanical and, and astronautical engineering from Utah State University. And he's also pursuing his PhD in mechanical engineering at UC Davis. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Vice Chair Gutna to our virtual stage. Take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, so I just wanna, begin by thanking uh, the Institute of Americas, um, the, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the School of Global Policy and Strategy at, at UC San Diego uh, for this wonderful opportunity to join you all this morning. Um, also wanna thank and recognize uh, Secretary Crowfoot's incredible leadership and contribution um, as the head of uh, CNRA and, and the incredible work that he is leading uh, to help with the climate uh, challenges and addressing the climate challenges. So I wanna set the stage on um, the SB100 vision and I'll talk a little bit about what the clean energy vision for California is, but that within the context, uh, the importance of making sure that transition happens reliably as well as equitably. To just uh, start the, set the stage at a very, a very high level, uh, just looking at the pie chart of current greenhouse gas emissions in California, as you see here on the chart, the electricity sector in California is roughly 14 to 15% today. Uh, some of that, about 9% comes from in-state generation and about 6% from imports. But you, as you see the rest of the pie chart, a large amount of, of emissions are from transportation. If you take the industrial sector portion uh, around the refining of petroleum and such, the transportation sector you know, goes close to 50%. So when we talk about decarbonizing the California's economy, uh, it's important to note, you know, what is the main strategy for California? So as we think through the main strategies of California, as we continue to think about the decarbonization of different sectors, whether it's industrial, transportation, residential or commercial, the collective consensus across the state's leadership agencies and the stakeholders in California is there is gonna be a large amount of electrification. So whether it's light duty vehicles, uh, whether it's buildings, uh, both residential and commercial, there'll be a large amount of electrification of new uh, a build that's gonna come on, but all, and also there's a recognition that is a significant amount of the economy will continue to depend on clean molecules. Uh, whether it's thermal combustion for industrial, you know, you know heating processes uh, for cement and, and such. So as we think through this, even though the emissions are only 14% or 15% from, from electricity today, given that the climate strategy is really dependent on 
um, a high electrification, we are going to continue to grow the electricity sector. Our current estimates is that we're going to grow that sector to approximately three, four fold by 2045. And we have to do that on the same path of uh, keeping it as, as close to zero carbon as possible. So then that, that's where the SB100 bill comes. So the SB100 bill, which is a landmark um, a law that was passed in 2018, uh, sets three main priorities for California. Number one, sets a 2045 goal of powering all retail electricity sold in California and the state agency electricity needs coming from either renewable sources or zero carbon sources. That's the first one. The second, it also updates the renewable portfolio standard, uh, which was at 50% by 2030 to 60% uh, by 2030. And finally, it requires the state's uh, main energy agencies, uh, that, that includes the California Energy Commission, where I work, the California Public Utilities Commission, as well as the California Air Resources Board, to use programs under existing laws to achieve these goals, but also develop a report every five years on both the feasibility, but also the tracking of this. So what we've done, um, the collectively the agencies uh, since, the, since the law has passed in 2018, has done a, a, a number of uh, workshops, you know, engagement with the stakeholders and put out our first report in 2021, which is really articulating, you know, whether this goal is feasible and what does it look like in terms of the resource build required to achieve something like this. So the first one here, you know, is to just kind of give you all a, a snapshot of what uh, California needs to build in order to be able to meet this SB100 goal. So as you see up there, there is a continued reliance on, on solar, uh, which is about 70 gigs uh, of, of new solar that is expected or needed to be built. You have a large amount of storage, but as a large amount of solar behind the meter. So that's the customer um, customer solar that, that continues to grow almost to 30, 30 gigs from today. And also there's a large amount of dependence on long duration storage, wind, both onshore and offshore, and some level of geothermal and, and, and such. The interesting number people ask here is the hydrogen fuel cells uh, and why that is zero. And, and the reason why it is zero is, is we are using uh, the current numbers that are, uh, that are available in terms of the cost. But as we continue to reduce the cost of hydrogen, that, that number could significantly change. So just uh, uh, giving a scale of what this means, you know, we currently build about uh, a gig of solar every year in, in, in you know, solar and wind in California. And we need to, on an average, build three times that on a continuing basis through 2045 to achieve the goals that we set for ourselves. And similarly for storage, we have to have an average 8x. So this number was based on uh, what we looked at you know, back in 2018, 2019 timeframe, uh, where we only had 200 megawatts of storage on grid. Uh, so we were looking at about building roughly 1600 to 2000 megawatts of new storage every year. And you know, currently over the last two years, we have the track record of adding that much of, of storage to the grid. The importance here though, you know, I, I set the stage of these large, incredibly large numbers, but it's important to note as we think about the, the way we are gonna achieve this, we've run a number of different uh, scenarios and, and, and here's a, a kind of a summary of that. What you're seeing in column one, which calls the SP100 core scenarios is basically looking at what are the off the shelf technologies we have, the cost curves we have for them and really building the stack of capacity that is needed to reach these goals. The next two, next three uh, columns that you're seeing here is really thinking about zero carbon dispatchable resources and zero carbon baseload resources that might be expensive today, but if we had zero carbon resources at a cost that is comparable to gas today, what would that look like? And as you see here, if we were to able to achieve a cost metrics that are comparable to, to current gas, which is about $60 a megawatt hour, if you can get to that with, with other resources, whether it's CCS, whether it's long duration storage, you know, whether it's fuel cells, you will really see the need for the utility scale solar and, um, and, and some of the behind the meter solar really reduces. Okay, so that was the, that's the plan and that's where we wanna go. 
but I just want to uh, pivot to, you know, how do we then think about reliability as we pursue this? And, and we are really experiencing a compounding amount of uncertainty in terms of reliability. And, and this is an animated slide. I'm just going to walk through the last few years of experience here. So first 2020, um, you know, typically when we plan for our reliability for a summer, we look at historical conditions and then we, we develop, uh, you know, trends on what the weather temperature could be, you know, what some of the uh, drought conditions could look like. And then we take them into our analysis and say, okay, you know, for this amount of demand for these kind of supply conditions, this is what we need and we plan for that. But what we experienced in 2020 was an extreme weather event in terms of regional heat that, that far exceeded our planning standards and, and really uh, you know, brought to bear, brought to the front the importance of reliability and the climate induced risks. And then as we went into 2021, uh, we started, okay, we understand the climate change uncertainty, you know, maybe we should start thinking through you know, these high heat events and the drought events and start putting them into our planning. As you, three, as you see here in the planning bucket on the, on the top line here, it says identifying contingency measures. What we've done is we systematized a bunch of measures we could quickly call upon, uh, like coordination between balancing authorities, calling large customers to load, to reduce voluntarily curtail their load and such. So we, we thought through uh, some of those and we systematized that. But what 2021 actually brought to us was, a, you know, apart from a high heat event and a high drought event, it was also a wildfire induced outages. Um, in 2021 on July 19th, we had the bootleg fire in, in Oregon, which knocked out 4,000 megawatts of transmission uh, imports coming into California. And suddenly, you know, you know in, a, in a moment's notice, you lose 4,000 megawatts and, and to really balance that is an incredibly hard job. And that's what we've experienced. And, and apart from that, we also started looking at the supply chain, you know, the COVID impacts, you know, in China, the ability to secure storage um, uh, you know, projects and such. And going into 2022, as we think through this planning situation, we are like, okay, the current planning does not take into account the cumulative effects of not just the heat and drought, to, to some extent we can understand them, but the fire risks to generation, which could be thousands of megawatts. So we're beginning to think through an idea of developing a strategic reserve for California. The administration has put out that idea to the legislature, which is under consideration. So again, going into 2022, apart from the heat and drought and wildfires, a new thing that came about is the Department of Commerce uh, recently launched an investigation into uh, whether solar panels coming from China are circumventing the tariffs that the that, uh, you know, United States has right now. And so the investigation essentially brought the solar and storage projects to a screeching halt. So that really um, you know, makes it difficult for us to build at the rate we want to build. In 2023, you know, some more things could come. So I just wanted to uh, state the, the, some of the lessons we've learned. And again, summarizing them, the big thing is, you know, undoubtedly, I mean, there's a broad consensus, you know, we're in California, um, you know, luckily we have a, a you know, the, the leadership in the state as well as broadly the, the community of the state really does believe, you know, climate crisis is here and we're currently planning to do, uh, you know, take steps to comprehensively assess that. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about the net peak period in the, in the next slide and the importance of that. And then the importance of recognizing that the electricity system and markets are rapidly transitioning into this clean energy, not just in California, but regionally. And so our dependence on each other really changes and, and hence the diversity of resources becomes really important. And finally, as we think through reliability, if we have a reliability situation, how do you uh, bring some measures on to fend off that concern on a given day? And one of the strategies that the state has depended on the last, last two years, unfortunately, has to turn on a number of diesel uh, bugs or temporary generators, which is counter to the climate goals that we wanna do. But at the same time, these generators are oftentimes in uh, low income housing areas or communities of concern and really affecting the equity. High level net peak versus gross peak. For those of you who are in industry, you, you, you understand uh, this really well. Uh, the bottom half of the chart really shows you uh, the generation from wind and solar. So as you, as you know, it's, it's very little, the wind, because of the amount of wind we have today in California, which is about 4,000 megawatts, um, versus the solar, which is about 10,000 megawatts of solar we have today behind the meter and 10,000 more in front of the meter. So about 20,000 megawatts total. 
So as you look at that cumulatively, you have a generation profile that provides a lot of clean energy generation between 7 and 5 p.m. And then you have a precipitous drop in that generation. So what happens is really looking at the time when you have a precipitous drop in those resources, but the load continues to stay because of the air conditioning loads and the heat. And that is our, our concern. So the salmon band that you see here is, the, is, is what's called the net peak period. And that's where the emergency periods over the last two years has happened. So um, one of the critical um, strategies to deal with that is obviously storage. And as I mentioned earlier in 2020, we had roughly 434 uh, megawatts by the end of 2020. And by end of 2023, we expect that to go to 4,000 megawatts. And, and it's been an incredible effort of coordination between all, all entities that are responsible, regulators, the grid operator, the utilities, everybody working together on a strategic plan to bring these on. And then the concern is like, is, is can storage perform and take the role of traditional resources that we were conventional resources that we have depended on, such as natural gas, for example, on the gas fleet. And we begin to see that over the last two years, you know, what you see up here in August 2020 is the small amount of storage that we had on the grid, really serving the purpose of, of meeting the ancillary services. But as you see, you know, between 2021 August and even this year, uh, you know, we, we begin to see the trends. It really starts looking at the charging patterns are happening in the middle of the day when you have excess solar uh, energy, and then it really dispatches in the net peak period. Here's kind of a slide on the importance of uh, the storage and then and the duration of storage you need. Mm -hmm. Currently, the four hour storage, the short duration storage that we have serves the needs because the band that you're looking at for that net peak period is about four hours. But some of the modeling, this is the results from some of the early modeling we have, and, and so and, and other entities have similar modeling. As you moved from 2022, 23, 24, depending on the resource mix we have, the number of hours of concern, the cumulative hours of concern uh, in the evening period begins to grow. Uh, so you're looking at 2024, 2025, it begins to grow to five hours, six hours. So this is kind of like pointing to the importance of having longer duration storage um, or, or, or storage that could serve for a longer period of time. And, and on the top of this, the important thing we need to note is as we go through electrification, the, the load in the winter start peaking. And then you also might see two different peaks, morning peak and evening peak. So you have this, uh, this need for meeting those, those peaks and may, being able to charge the batteries to serve those load. So that's kind of like where I want to uh, stop, you know, obviously in terms of building this huge build, you know, we have to, uh, you know, work to uh, make sure that the land use and the biodiversity and the conservation goals are in sync uh, with the electricity and the clean energy transition side, and we do so really well. California has a, a very good track record of doing that, and, you know, as, as, um, as you will probably hear from Secretary Crowfoot on, on the incredible work that the CNRA is doing, there's a very close coordination on how we do this uh, together in a way that we secure reliable affordable energy for the future, while also ensuring our carbon neutrality goals and the goals to ensure that our environment and the biodiversity is taken care of. Thank you. So um, I've got a couple of questions I wanna um, uh, uh, frame it for, for this discussion. First, um, I wanna talk about the issue you raised related to China and you, you, you spoke about the, uh, the challenges we're facing now from a supply chain perspective and getting solar uh, panels, not just for California, but throughout the country. Um, I know that recently Governor Newsom uh, signed a MOU with the People's Republic of China. I wanted to see if you could maybe talk about that MOU and how that might be able to help uh, promote greater cooperation between the PRC and California in addressing some of our joint climate challenges. Yeah, um, Richard, I could speak uh, to, the, to the extent of um, the, the kind of the energy coordination within that MOU uh, and, and first kind of like recognizing Governor Newsom's incredible leadership, not just um, in, in developing uh, the, the MOU with China and the continuing work with China, uh, but also his leadership on uh, helping tackle this uh, crisis with the Department of Co Commerce right now. Um, he has been a champion of, of, of moving uh, that conversation with Department of Commerce. So I think at, at the high level, I think the, the important uh, points on the MOU that are 
uh, relevant for us is the coordination on ensuring that the clean energy uh, goals are in sync and the ability for us to coordinate on ensuring the supply chain um, constraints are understood and, and also there's coordination and cooperation on estimating the California needs and how um, the business development could occur. So I think that's that's the element uh, that, that we have been focused on. To the broader uh, coordination elements, that's something that uh, I do not currently track. Thank you. Um, um, in your closing remarks, you had um, spoke about uh, balancing uh, some of the priorities for California in terms of biodiversity. Um, I want to um, see if you can maybe delve into that in a little more detail. As you know, um, there's a lot of controversy um, regarding wind, um, wind generation, wind farms, and the impact on migratory bird birds. California is looking to try to protect some of its uh, priority species. And also um, in Southern California, in Imperial Valley, um, we have um, um, environmental organizations concerned about the impacts of solar panels on, um, on desert um, tortoises. And, and other um, critically endangered or threatened species. So I wanna see if you can maybe talk about that because obviously while the state is looking to become more um, energy resilient at the same time, we're also looking to protect our biodiversity. So I wanna see how you might be able to respond to that and, and how the state's reconciling some of those issues. Yeah, uh, really important points. Um, so just wanna start with these, uh, these goals uh, that are, um, all need to happen, right? They're not mutually exclusive. So I think we have the clean energy transition goals. Uh, we have the biodiversity goals and, and the broader climate goals. So I think the, the main point I, I kind of wanna, um, I, I thought through this, this question of what has California done? You know, if you look at the DRECP uh, process, you know, which was a broad stakeholder process, really thinking through recognizing zones in California for renewable development that took many years. I think the, the main point that, uh, that, that needs to be recognized is the importance of stakeholder engagement, recognizing all the goals and having a comprehensive strategic plan. I think um, we have a good history in California in coordinating across you know, siloed agencies of different priorities and, and making sure you know, there is a stakeholder uh, process that ensures that all goals are reasonably met. So I think moving forward, uh, one of the one of my slides, uh, which which points towards the need for diversity of new resources, that's really important, right? So that the more diversity of resources we have, there is higher opportunity to have attributes that minimize the land use and biodiversity impacts. So I think you know my my general thing around that is coordination and strategic planning uh, in a way that it looks at long-term goals and making sure uh, all the agencies are talking through the different priorities and optimizing the solutions. All right, Sir Gutner, I wanna thank you for your, um, your time today. I, I know you have a hard stop at 9.30, so I wanna be respectful for your time. So thank you for joining us today and we look forward to um, continuing this conversation. Yeah, Richard, thank you so much for the thank opportunity you. and to your entire team, thanks. No, thank you. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce California Secretary of Natural Resources, Wade Crowfoot. Secretary Crowfoot oversees the agency's 21,000 employees who protect and manage California's natural environment. His responsibilities include stewarding the state's forests and natural lands, our rivers and waterways, our coastlines and oceans, as well as protecting fish and wildlife and overseeing our energy development. As a member of the governor's cabinet, Secretary Crawford advises the governor on natural resources and envir environmental issues. Prior to serving as secretary, Secretary Crawford led the Water Foundation, a nonprofit philanthropy that builds shared water solutions across the American West. Before that, Secretary Crawford served as the governor's, Governor Jerry Brown's um, deputy cabinet secretary and senior advisor. He also previously served as the West Coast Regional Director for the Environmental Defense Fund, as well as a Senior Environmental Advisor to then San Francisco Mayor um, Gavin Newsom. Secretary Crawford received his bachelor's degree from political, of, in political science from the University of, Wis of Wisconsin-Madison, and he also earned a master's degree in public policy from the London School of Economics, graduating with honors. At this time, I'm pleased to welcome Secretary Wade Crawford to our virtual stage. Secretary, take it away. Hey, thanks so much, Richard, and thanks to all who have tuned in to this important in, uh, symposium. 
I know speaking for Governor Newsom, we are all really excited to join the Summit of the Americas that are ha that's happening next week, where we're having heads of state uh, from across the Americas come together uh, and focus, among other things, on this climate challenge uh, we now face. So I want to step back and uh, share my thoughts on, on sort of the larger context in which leaders from these countries come together. Uh, climate change is obviously accelerating and it is impacting our nations, our states, our provinces in ways that frankly alarms us. Um, in California, for example, we modeled, we estimated based on science that climate change and, and a hotter, more unstable climate would have impacts on our state. But frankly, we thought a lot of those impacts were going to begin to be visible the middle part of the century or even later in the century. And now in California, we feel very much like we're on the front, front lines of climate change. Um, we are experiencing catastrophic wildfire risk. Um, this natural cycle of wildfires that we experience in our state and frankly, you know, exists around the world has become supercharged. Uh, by increasingly dry forests and landscapes and hotter temperatures during the fire season uh, that make very small fires historically uh, much larger and more dangerous. We're in the middle of a drought. Uh, we're in the third year of a worsening drought. In the last seven years, five of them have been uh, pretty intense drought years. Increasingly across the American West, we talk about the aridification of the climate meaning the drying out of the climate due to these hotter temperatures. Uh, never too far away from our uh, concerns are, is flooding as the rain and snow that do fall in California fall during these, increasingly during these intense winter storms that we are now calling atmospheric rivers because they're bringing so much precipitation at one time. And then of course, extreme heat uh, as these hotter temperatures concentrate heat waves, um, we've experienced record temperatures uh, across California, including, we believe, the hottest temperature ever recorded on the planet uh, at Death Valley in the last couple of years. And then lastly, sea level rise and impacts on our coast and our marine ecosystem, um, which, of course, is something that many nations, many provinces and states across the Americas from Canada to South America experience. And my own uh, experience in, uh, in recent conversations with leaders from around the world, equivalents uh, helping manage the environment in different parts of the world is each country is experiencing the impacts of climate change slightly differently, but the, the vast majority of conversations I've had, I've been I've been really struck that uh, everybody is actually now having to deal with the impacts of climate change, even as we transition our economies uh, to clean energy to reduce carbon pollution. Just last week, I was part of a conversation that included the province of British Columbia in Canada, um, where they're facing similar concerns around wildfire and flooding. Uh, I know that. Uh, uh, countries in South America, uh, Chile comes to mind um, with a similar Mediterranean climate, have increasing concerns about this twin threat of wildfires and, and drought. Um, so it should be very interesting over the next week to hear environment ministers, heads of state, uh, folks from subnational governments like me, uh, the provinces and the states, come together to talk about these shared challenges. In California, we recognize that we need to continue to drive down carbon pollution, which we know is critical to stabilize uh, our, our planet's atmosphere. In other words, reduce our carbon emissions, but at the same time, build the resilience of our communities and natural places to those impacts that I mentioned that are already here. So Commissioner Gunda did a really good job giving you a sense of how detailed our focus is on the energy sector. And that is both driving towards 100% clean energy, but at the same time, maintaining the reliability of our system. 
given this extreme heat that's stressing our grid and wildfire, which impacts um, the, the provision of, of electricity. So I would say, you know, five years, 10 years in the past, what we call climate mitigation, you know, attacking pollution, used to be very separated from climate adaptation, which was all about adapting to the climate change. And climate adaptation was seen as a sort of a, a, a wonky future planning exercise. But now we know that climate adaptation is a matter of protecting our, our residents in California. And it's a real and present danger, the impacts of climate change. So we're working to do both. I'll share that in California, we have updated our state's California climate adaptation strategy. And that's essentially meant to be this umbrella strategy that's driving everything that we're doing um, to attack drought and wildfire and these other risks. And that and one can find the updated strategy simply by putting into a, a website search, California climate adaptation strategy. And that climate adaptation strategy has six overriding priorities that I wanna mention because it really shows you, you know, what we're prioritizing in the climate resilience work. Um, number one, strengthen protections for the most vulnerable communities. Recognizing across the Americas, some of our communities are more vulnerable to these impacts than others. And we didn't need to disproportionately focus on those that are most vulnerable. Number two, bolster public health and safety uh, amidst these climate impacts. So really focus on um, where are threats to health and safety. So for example, uh, in wildfire, it's not only protecting communities that could get attacked by one of these catastrophic wildfire fires, but it's also addressing the impact of toxic smoke um, that travels across our state during wildfire season. The third priority is uh, to focus on building a climate resilient economy. So making sure that we're protecting our economy from these climate impacts. Number four is deploy nature-based solutions and build the resilience of our natural systems to climate change. This is a really important priority. And I'll say internationally, there has been less conversation on nature-based solutions than technology solutions. Yet we know that our lands, our water, our ocean are really, really critical, uh, both uh, to reduce uh, or achieve carbon neutrality um, by reducing emissions, by limiting things like catastrophic wildfire, but also letting our lands and our waters actually re remove carbon from the atmosphere and store that carbon. So increasingly in California, we're really lifting up uh, nature as a critical piece of the puzzle in all that we do on climate. Number five, uh, make decisions on the best available science. And that's absolutely critical because climate change is moving so fast. We need to look ahead. We need to look around the corner on what we need to do. And it's science that's uh, really identifying that. And the science is changing very fast. So we need to communicate across governments across institutions to really ensure that we have science that informs action. And then the last is partner uh, and collaborate to leverage resources. You know, in state government, we feel like it's absolutely essential to collaborate with our federal government in the United States, but also our local governments and our tribal governments, and as well as our academic and research institutions and all manner of of stakeholders uh, in this work. We know that if we only have a strategy for state agencies or state government, ultimately we're not going to achieve our, our climate goals, either to reduce pollution and achieve carbon neutrality or net zero, or to protect our people and natural places from, from climate impacts. So partnering is absolutely critical and it's, it's, it's germane uh, a priority because that's exactly what symposia like this are actually helping to facilitate. So that's really the umbrella we have, the, the climate adaptation strategy, which is really meant to identify the constellation of our priorities that is really guiding our work. And then we have these sectoral strategies, 
So you heard a deep dive from Commissioner Gunda before me on what we're doing on energy. We have similarly focused initiatives uh, in each of these areas uh, that are impacted by climate change, whether that's our, our landscapes and forests and wildfire, whether that's our water systems uh, from drought and flooding, or whether that's our coastal communities from the impacts of sea level rise. We also have, uh, for the first time in almost a decade, uh, an extreme heat action plan focused on what we're going to do to protect communities this summer into future years and decades from these worsening heat waves. And each of these sectoral efforts uh, has some, some, some key principles that guide them. One is they need to be focused and action oriented. So we're, we really simply don't have the time to talk about problems or talk about challenges without identifying specifically what we're going to do about them. So if for each of those areas I, I mentioned, we have specific action plans that have measurable actions that we need to take to build resilience. And I'm really thankful that Governor Newsom and our state legislature have come together to make unprecedented investments, state funding um, that bolster these actions. Between last year's budget and this year's proposed budget that's being discussed in Sacramento, our capital right now, believe it or not, California will spend upwards of $35 billion uh, to advance our climate actions, both our efforts to achieve carbon neutrality and uh, our work to build climate resilience. And those are huge scaled up investments which is making a difference right now. For example, in the last year, we've spent several hundred million dollars on specific projects around California communities that are protecting those communities from wildfire. And likewise, we are spending billions of dollars helping local water agencies diversify their water supplies to become more drought resilient. So action oriented. Our action plans are also transparent. We think it's really important for everybody to understand how state government is tackling these problems so that others can draft off these actions, whether they're cities or counties or non-governmental organizations or our federal agency partners. So each of these action plans is shared publicly. We are not strategizing in a black box uh, in the Capitol about what to do. We've really built these action plans in partnership um, with those impacted across the state. And then thirdly, these action plans are really meant to, yes, hold ourselves accountable for what we need to do, but really look toward actions that are going to empower others across our state. You know, in California, we have so many different types of areas and landscapes and communities. We can't take a one size fits all a set of actions to build climate resilience. So many of our efforts are really focused on empowering the different regions of our state to take the actions they need to build their climate resilience. And when I think about other nations that'll be part of the Summit for the Americas in coming days, whether it's Canada or Mexico or other nations in Central and South America, many of those nations are so large um, that different parts of their countries are impacted differently from climate change. And so one thing I would um, commend to them is really avoiding that one size fits all that, that's centrally executed out of the capital and instead really build the, the, and empower the, the regions to understand the threats they face and then allow them uh, to take action in an effective way. So really that's our approach. We're excited to continue to learn from other nations and other states and provinces. We are really excited to share the models of, of what's worked. I know one area of focus for your discussion here in the next couple of days will be our coast and our ocean environment. Um, and we know how impacted our ocean is from climate change, absorbing uh, a lot of that carbon pollution, um, warming and becoming more acidic. So we have focused efforts 
underway to protect marine ecosystems amidst climate change and are spending uh, millions and even tens of millions of dollars uh, toward that end. And in that respect, partnering with uh, other nations, other states and provinces and researchers from around the world to really understand what we need to do uh, to protect our marine uh, ecosystems. I'll say that you know, we don't have enough time uh, to simply study a problem without also taking action. And we don't have enough time to work in silos, either geographically or topically. We need to take action and, and monitor how it's working and then adapt those actions. And we need to move forward. And as we're moving forward, learn from others what they're doing to adapt our approaches. So Richard, I'll stop there. And I know you have a couple of questions uh, that you may want to ask and then would be glad to entertain any other questions that may, uh, may be out there. Thank you, Secretary. Um, no, I appreciate that. And thank you so much for your remarks. I, I wanted to ask you about um, Governor Newsom's 30 by 30 initiative that you've been leading. Um, what what steps are you taking to reach the goal of 30% biodiversity in the state of California, and um, and how is that being um, implemented, and um, uh, what what sort of challenges do you see in in reconciling that um, ambitious uh, plan with the state's um, goals for net zero? Well, we are really excited to be part of this global movement to conserve or protect more lands and waters around the planet. Um, some may know that there are a high, it's called the High Ambition Coalition of Countries that have made commitments to conserve 30% of their own lands and waters as part of this global effort. And scientists through our Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change I, identified that conserving land, conserving water, is really critical to meet our international 2030 climate goals. It's also really critical to stave off the mass extinction crisis that's happening across the planet, where we're seeing the loss of biodiversity uh, across our planet. So Governor Newsom stepped up with a support of uh, and vision of our state legislature and set our own target to conserve 30% of our lands and coastal waters in the next seven years. And we're excited to have a strategy now in place and to be moving down the field on that. And what that means is we need to improve conservation on over 6 million acres of California's lands. That's almost 2.5 million hectares of land in California. And really double the amount of our state waters, which run from the beach to three miles off the coast, double the amount of our state waters that are conserved. We're really excited about this because we think we can do it in a way that will uh, protect our biodiversity, help us meet our climate goals and ensure that our lands and waters can re re remove and store carbon, and also to expand uh, equitable access into the outdoors, which is another critical priority of the governors. Now, part of, the, part of this 30 by 30 has to rely on good planning because as Sivagunda, pointed out earlier, we have to build out a lot of energy infrastructure and renewable energy infrastructure to meet our, our clean energy goals. And likewise, in California, we have to continue to build more housing to address affordability challenges in the state. The good news is within this pathway for 20, uh, 30 by 30 uh, is uh, lifting up the importance of planning in counties across our state. Many counties actually have plans where they identify where uh, is appropriate for energy and housing development and where is most important to protect uh, for environmental function. Uh, so one of the things we're doing is investing in that local plannings to ensure that we meet all of these goals. And I'm really gratified that Canada and Mexico, for example, are leading on 30 by 30 as well as other of South American countries and really excited to learn from them around um, what they're doing to continue to bolster our approach. Thank you, Secretary. Um, you spoke earlier about the Summit of the Americas. Um, Governor Newsom is gonna be co-hosting it with President Biden and Mayor Garcetti from LA. I wanna um, get your perspective on, um, on what California hopes to get out of the Summit of the Americas. Um, as you, you mentioned in your remarks, um, many subnational leaders are going to be there. California has been a leader um, in 
in forging um, relationships with other countries, with other subnationals. Uh, we have the cap and trade program with Quebec. Um, there's also um, the governor's efforts on the Commission of the Californias to promote greater um, cooperation with Baja California, Baja California Sur in Mexico. So um, would welcome some of your thoughts about some of those opportunities that you see coming into the Summit of the Americas next week. Well, I'll say that from California's standpoint, international collaboration is critical to, to meet the challenges we face. Um, and none greater than climate change. And Governor Newsom and before him, Governor Brown and Governor Schwarzenegger were really active in this international effort to combat climate change. You know, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. So while we aren't a nation state, uh, I think we have the potential to provide a powerful model of climate action and how we're taking action to combat climate change in a way that maintains our economic prosperity. And so we, for example, uh, last week, the governor signed a MOU with the nation of New Zealand, um, recognizing its leadership, its policy leadership on climate change and recognizing New Zealand finds it helpful to collaborate directly with California, given our scale and on our advanced environmental policymaking. So really, we think next week is an opportunity to continue to underscore the priority of shared commitment on climate change and then rolling up sleeves and solving problems together. And within the Americas, we have so many critically important leaders on environmental topics. Um, we think next week will build momentum for our collective action. Thank you. Um, on that point, I know that many countries in Latin America are looking at also the challenges of in making the climate in, um, investments uh, in light of the current financial crisis and COVID recovery. I wanted to see if you could maybe talk about some of the things that California is learning in terms of creating green and blue jobs um, in, uh, in the California economy. And in particular, um, if you could maybe highlight some of the um, efforts that California is making towards investing in nature-based solutions. Uh, we have many people on our uh, forum that are um, in countries from throughout the, um, the Americas, and I think they could benefit from some of your perspectives on this. Certainly. So, you know, first of all, climate impacts are costing us more and more money. Uh, and so from my perspective, we either make investments now or um, pay, um, in, in much greater amounts later. An example are, are wildfires. When we have a big catastrophic wildfire, um, like ones we've had in recent years, the cleanup costs um, to help those communities that have been ravaged by the wildfires totals billions of dollars for each fire. And so we know that you know an, an ounce of present prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I would say first, but it's it's hard to measure because you can't predict with certainty what those future costs will be. But I can tell you that we've start to in, started to incur many of those costs, and so now we understand that the the upfront investments are um, are very very important. Also, these, trend, these investments, if made up front, can save money on the back end. So, for example, California's investment in, in, in energy efficiency um, in the past couple of decades have resulted in less energy used by consumers and saved consumers billions of dollars. Likewise, investments in solar and wind energy um, look really good now because they provide free abundant energy as fossil fuel costs increase. No doubt that sh making these shifts um, will cost money. Um, but I think it's absolutely imperative because, you know, the, the failure to do so is, you know, continued reliance on fossil fuels, which are, you know, m more and more unpredictable in terms of their cost um, and continued um, worsening of our climate impacts, which will then cascade, you know, costs down the road. 
So from our perspective, you know, we think that innovative financing, for example, low interest loans or no interest loans um, are a really good idea where we can help uh, industry and in make these investments in transitioning um, in ways that then repay over time. So I think the more that we can work across borders on what are these financing mechanisms to enable this transition, um, the better. Because I'm convinced that you know now is the time to make these investments. It's not five years from now, it's not 10 years from now. Uh, we have to find ways to work together to make the investments now. Thank you, Secretary. With that, I think we're gonna to have to um, close out our session. I wanna thank you, Secretary Krakow, for your um, excellent remarks and perspectives.